Druids love nature. There's nothing they like more than to lie out under the stars to celebrate the seasons. But they also love the arts too. They love to sit around a fire listening to stories. They love making music and so on. But also in Druidry, you have a tradition of scholarship, a tradition that goes back for hundreds of years. Now, in that tradition, there is also, unfortunately, some rather poor scholarship and some fantasy and speculation. And so we decided to start a project that would foster good scholarship within Druidry and related subjects. And every year, we ask someone to research a particular topic. And then every four years, we all come together at a conference to hear the results of their research. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, apparently, the uh, Siberian bards, before they uh, launched into reciting their epics, would fortify themselves with fly agaric mushroom. <laughs> I prefer tea. <laughs> this will keep me going. So the title of my talk was What is a Bard? And I was drawing on research that I did for my PhD back in the early part of the millennium. And uh, I was trying to uh, draw people's attention to the fact that the habitual definition of the bard that we're all familiar with as someone who is inspired, as someone who seeks to channel Arwen into works of creativity, that this is uh, quite a recent definition. The bard in traditional cultures, it's a job, it's a profession that you're born into. It relies on patronage, it relies on a, a bardic culture. The bard is a remembrancer, a satirist, a praise poet, and a teller of epic. And I was suggesting that although we can't go back to traditional bardism, we can go some way towards reviving some aspects of it. And this will make the bardism that we do more accessible to a non-initiated public. I feel that in the 21st century we need to move into a whole new paradigm of doing history. We have to put consciousness, the history of consciousness, and the history of mind, and the history of soul, and the history of thought, and the history of inspiration, back into mainstream history. Not as a sub-discipline called history of art, or history of religions, but actually that is the history of us as human beings. So the title of the talk was Druidry and Transpersonal History. It's published in this form, it's, a, it's available as a book, and it's a very detailed study, about 80 pages long, of the findings of my doctoral thesis, which is proposing a new genre of history, transpersonal history, which marries transpersonal psychology, people like Sagioli, Jung and Ken Wilber, with conventional scientific history, which looks at the layering of events in time. I'm arguing that historians have not yet taken on board depth psychology, the findings of transpersonal psychology, let alone sort of quantum physics and, and new theories about the relationship of consciousness to matter. Most historians are working from a materialist paradigm. So this new field of history, transpersonal history, can therefore help us map the history of Druidry from its very earliest prehistoric times, right through Neolithic and, and the later you know, periods in uh, ancient history, medieval history. And what I've done in the talk today is, is give an overview, a synthesis of how transpersonal history can make sense of the history of Druidry. Um, and one of the reasons it's, it's not really taught, it's not known about, I'm arguing, is because our society has become so secularist and materialist in orientation. We're not interested in higher you know, intellectual history and the spiritual history that Druidry bore witness to. I also talk about the peace witness of Druids and how transpersonal history can help heal conflicts between Islam, Christianity, Judaism, paganism. And the main thrust of my talk is that the, the revealed religions that have a text and the ancient religions that are oral and that tend to have a pantheon, including goddesses, that's the real rift on the planet that needs healing. Now Luke was getting hungry, he was just a little sad. 
He had such good intentions, he was getting mighty mad. He said, Look here, Bold Dorman, I can do them all. Yes, I can, every one, every single one. So if you value your employment, let me in the room, word hall. Fairy is not fiction. Though all druids do not consort with the folk of fairy, none can escape the long history of encounters with those hidden peoples in Celtic culture, and indeed in most of the pre-modern world. My thesis is that modern druids do well to return to what has been called the fairy faith and understand it as part of reality every bit as real as the materialist reality that dominates the Western worldview. We in the West discarded belief in the hidden people and their realms sometime in the 19th century. Then we went about the world trying to convince indigenous peoples everywhere else to do the same. We are still doing it today, and we would do well to consider this factor when we are surprised by hatred and resistance to our gospel of materialism. That gospel threatens traditional beliefs that shape the very fabric of being in many cultures. Today I'm speaking specifically about the transition that occurred between the oral culture that accepted elves and, and fairy folk as a part of reality, even though it was a, a different part, you know, that wasn't quite the ordinary material world, and then through its transformation into literature and fantasy and fiction, uh, becoming something that, that our culture pushes aside and, and excludes from reality, even though practically, you know, I mean, a lot of people, I shouldn't say practically everyone, but a lot of people, and young people particularly, are tremendously interested in it. Um, and that's the, that's the shift that I think is, is Im important for us to grasp and also to understand that it's, it's an imaginal reality, not just imagination in the sense of something that's not true, but it's imaginal and therefore also real, as real as the material world that we interact with with our senses. The title of my piece, From the Solstice to the Equinox and Back Again, uh, the challenge of the midpoint between solstice and equinox on human health, and the use of medicinal plants to modify that challenge to health, to help us deal with the transition from summer to winter and back again. Plants, of course, uh, provide us with these materials to be able to modulate the effects of hormonal transitions. And uh, it is quite remarkable um, how plants, the biochemistry of plants is built into our own biology, though we have different purposes, of course. And the point that I want to put to you very strongly, is that we are not passive observers of the seasons. We are participants. Mm -hmm. And we participate, and I'm sorry for this bit of scientific materialism, we participate with our hormones. <coughs> How do we recognize not only the seasons, but any information? Effectively, at the deepest level, it is a flood of water against a membrane, a double membrane, which is selective to salts. And that is the basis for the energy in a plant and in, a, uh, and in an animal, that cells contain water and the water floods against the membrane and creates an active potential, in other words, a small electric current. That's the source of the energy. The energy, of course, in the first place, is harnessed on Earth by the chloroplasts, by the green plants. And it is that energy with which we're here today. 
and everything we do and think and say depends upon the energy of the sun. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. It's just lovely to, to, to see everybody here. And um, I hope we'll see you again before 2016. But as, as a number of people have said, probably people have said to me, to all three Mount Hemus uh, conferences, because that's 12 years. And it's amazing how time flies. So if we don't see you in between times, it'd be lovely to see you again in 2016. And um, now is the time to finish and to resort either to a local hostel um, or, or cathedral, depending upon your inclinations. Or perhaps you might want to do both. So thank you all for coming. Yeah.